This is number one. This is episode number one in what we hope to become a weekly series. We are approaching pitchers and catchers reporting, and then after that, the first spring training game, and then after that, opening day 2019. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler. I'm the voice of the Lansing Lugnuts. I handle media relations. I also write for Kevin Reichardt's Ballpark Digest, Football Stadium Digest, Arena Digest, however I am uh, needed, however I'm required. I love to pitch in, help write, edit. Um, and this is with big thanks to Ballpark Digest that we are doing this Facebook live chatting through their Facebook page. Now I'll be joined by Mick Gillespie and we are going to talk about talking about baseball, the broadcaster's side. What Ballpark Digest does such a really good job of is the business of baseball, the promotions of baseball, all of the different news of it. And so what we are going to take you in with is the side of the broadcaster. And so from Mick and myself, and so let's bring Mick. And then the two of us will talk about our side of it, the role of the broadcaster in the booth. Marty Brenneman retiring at the end of this season from the Cincinnati Reds and onward. Mick, here we go. How are you? Yeah, good, man. I can, can hear, hear you me? perfectly. Let's start with this. Let's oh, officially good. introduce ourselves. You go first. Yeah, Mick Gillespie, uh, broadcaster for the Tennessee Smokies. Been here since the Cubs have been uh, the Smokies affiliate, so uh, I've had this this chair for a while. Uh, I get to do uh, spring training with the Cubs and some SEC network and Alabama pre and post game football on their flagship station and uh, some high school football, just a lot of broadcasting <laughs> stuff. That's the fun of this is I was thinking about it. The two of us in general, because we're radio guys, we exist faceless. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what I remember as a kid, too. Uh, you know, I listened to uh, Chuck Thompson as a, as a kid in Baltimore. And then when I met Chuck the first time, I didn't know what he really looked like. And I just happened to walk by and, uh, and I heard him. And then his wife saw me, like, staring at him. <laughs> and she said, hey, you want to meet Chuck? I said, sure. <laughs> you know, but it was, the, it was his voice that I heard first. This is where Mick and I, we have a lot in common, but that's one thing is we're both Marylanders. So a brief introduction to me. I'm from Prince George's County, Maryland, just outside D.C. I worked for the Brockton Rocks as a board op, pregame, postgame call-in show host for the Can-Am League Brockton Rocks in 05. 607 with the Montgomery Biscuits, where I came across Mick in the Southern League, 08 with the Windy City Thunderbolts, and since 09, the Lansing Lugnuts. I'll tell you a quick Chuck Thompson story. I was interning, really shadowing, for WBAL in Baltimore. And one of the first jobs that they gave me was there was a rumor in the newsroom that Chuck had died. And so everyone was trying to figure out is this true? Because if this is, this is the lead story, but no one could substantiate it. And so they looked at me as the youngest person there and they gave me his home phone number and they said, set up an interview. Yeah. And I called and I woke up his wife and I said, is Chuck available for an interview next week? And she said, that'd be great. And I thanked her and I hung up the phone. My knees were shaking. And I said, he's not dead yet. <laughs> yeah, Betty. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, she was great. She was great. Yeah, he, uh, you know, he, he was six generations of radio and television in Baltimore. And then when, um, when he retired, and I know we're going to talk about Marty Brenneman here in a few minutes. Uh, I don't think Marty's going to do the same thing. When Chuck retired in 82 from radio, he just went over and did TV, you know, so it wasn't like he was out of baseball. Uh, he kept, he kept uh, in the booth into the 2000s. I mean, he was there for six generations uh, but then John Miller took over after him. So you went from, you know, one Hall of Famer right into another. And so when I left the Baltimore market, I was really surprised that the radio wasn't always as good as I was used to. You know, the baseball wasn't so compelling, you know, and, and, um, you know, and I feel like, you know, these days it, that you don't really have as many entertainers and storytellers like, like Chuck and John Miller uh, both are. Uh, you know, it's a different world now, you know, but I think a part of it is that not as many people watch uh, or listen to the games anymore. They watch them, you know, and so you, your bigger stars are on television. But, you know, when I when I was a kid, uh, you know, Chuck and then John Miller, I mean, I, you couldn't watch all the games, you know, I mean, they could watch some of them unless you really, you know, you were rich and you had like the Comcast sports package, you know, which back then you had to have a big satellite and everything else. Uh, 
uh, you know, so you, you really caught a lot of them on local television or on, and, and all of them on the radio. Let me ask you, because I've been talking to people about where is radio going with regards to baseball broadcasting? And you talked about how more and more folks, it's the video. It's, so you can see the highlights. Or you can take it in how you can catch up, but it's got to be right. visual. So where is radio going with baseball play-by-play? Well, I think there's a couple problems that baseball radio has. And I think first off that the executives, some of them making the decisions really don't know the difference between good radio and not good radio. Uh, they, they, you know, back in the, in the old days, you know, there were people that really understood the art of going on the radio and keeping people entertained, you know, uh, I think more, it's so political in some markets that it, it really, they don't really understand that, you know, Hey, look, this guy's been doing this and people recognize him. That doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be compelling to sit there and listen to him do a baseball game. And it takes baseball is a lot different than the other sports too, because as you know, Jesse, I mean, it takes you about three to 500 games to kind of find your niche in it, you know, and that's doing the, I think the entire game and making mistakes and, you know, kind of grinding it out and, and going through it. Um, uh, you know, I just think you just have to have the, you know, the pitfalls of, you know, having uh, a bad game or two to learn from it, you know, and then also knowing enough people that they can give you an honest assessment of where you are. I, I've never been in another business where everyone thinks they're great at, it, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter how good or bad you are. I, I really haven't met many people that say, you know what, I was that I'm a terrible broadcaster because if someone comes up to you and they say, Hey, I, I heard you on the radio last night, you assume that means that they thought you were really good, you know? Um, but you know, the guys like Chuck Thompson, and, and John Miller and, and, and the all-time greats that we were fortunate enough to listen to and then guys in other markets, uh, uh, you know, th there's, you want to be able to keep the game in perspective. Uh, you want to be able to tell the stories that go along with the players and the teams and, and current events and, and be, and be funny and, and be fun to listen to, you know, even when, and, and be honest too, you know, like it, I, I feel like I, when I listen to, to a, broadcasts and I'm not just talking about major league baseball I'm just saying baseball in general I hear a lot of tv guys doing doing uh radio they don't paint the picture you know it's a, it's you know ball strike you know here's where it is you get the basics but but you're not really you know if you if you had a chance to listen to Vince Gully it was just amazing you know like how many details or listen next time you listen to John Miller just don't pay attention to what's actually going on in the game count the amount of details that he gives you between pitches uh, about the batter, about the field, about the fans, where you can really visualize it. And and so you say, well, where's baseball on radio going? I, I'm not sure. I think there's always going to be a, a market uh, for it in, you know, the hometowns of teams because you can't always be in front of the television. But I really hope that that the some of the executives out there will pay more attention to, you know, the, the, the art of doing it because that's what made radio so great before. That's what still makes it great. The same thing that was good, you know, when, when um, Mel Allen was doing it, who, by the way, is over my shoulder there, or Red Barber, you know, the, the first, like, Hall of Famers, it's the same thing that's good now. The, the, the details, the fun, you know, the stories. There's an excitement that you have to find every single day when you're doing baseball, uh, even when your team's terrible, um, you know, like the Orioles last year had the worst year ever, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what Joe Angel and, and, and those guys would say that they did to make every game important. But the best part about it is every game is important because it's its own game, right? It's its own story. Um, it, the better that the broadcast is, the more people will listen. And, and that's up to the people that do the hiring and the teams are, and I say executives, radio executives, team executives, uh, to go out there and really find the best people to do the it. The two people that their words stayed with me, with that respect, what you just brought up of, if the team's terrible, what then? Dan Dickerson once told me, yesterday is not today, tomorrow's not today, each game is its separate thing and you better treat it separately. And I know that Ben Wagner, now with the Blue Jays, always writes at the top of his scorecard, why? And that is, with the big picture, why with this game? Why does this game matter? And for each player, why for yeah. this player, this at bat or this pitch, or why this inning? Or He's perpetually searching for the why. 
And when he finds the answer to that, then he can share that with the audience. Why does this mean something right now? Yeah, yeah well, that's why I have Red Barber over my shoulder. Um, I got that. This was um, in Mel Allen's personal effects. I went to Alabama and Mel Allen's, all of his personal effects are at the library. And Mel's brother, when he was still alive, gave me um, permission to go in there. And, uh, and I got a copy of that picture of Mel and Red, uh, who infamously weren't really that, you know, maybe and that diametrically other, philosophically right? opposed and on broadcast. Ex exactly, which we could do a whole hour on that. But, um, but I put that picture in here because we're, when I started my career, uh, the, the broadcaster that kind of took me under his wing was uh, uh, a guy named Mark Hauser. And, uh, and, and Doogie was like, hey, look, you need to do this. Start with this Red Barber book. And so I read the broadcasters by Red Barber. And I've challenged a lot of the interns that I've had over the years to do the same thing. Because it's like a history book of, of broadcasting. But you get into, towards the middle, maybe the end of the book, of what he did to lay out his broadcast every day. And one of the things was, you know, finding that, like you said, with Ben Wagner, the, the, the storylines of the day, and then repeating those storylines. And sometimes it's not the records of the teams or the pennant race. You know, sometimes I can remember years where, you know, the Smokies were not so good. And, um, you know, we had, we had a season where Justin Bohr was, we thought he had a chance to win the MVP at every day. We, you know, what, what's Justin Bohr doing? You know, the other guys that were in the mix, because we wanted to create some reason for people to want to stick around and, and mm -hmm. listen to that game. Let me throw this at you. I just picked up Crack of the Bat, which is James Walker's history of baseball on the radio. Pat Hughes wrote the foreword. And in this, he put, yeah. do you know Pat's eight exemplary skills for a broadcaster? All right, yeah, here you go. Us. The professional announcer. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on each of these eight, or just if you want to add a ninth or a tenth. The professional announcer starts with solid, accurate reporting, is fair to all, including players, managers, front office executives, and umpires, has a pleasing voice that wears well over the long season, Possesses a lively sense of humor and a distinctive personality and knows how to tell a good story. Draws on a rich vocabulary and command of the language. Creates a home run call that is distinctive and original. Senses the drama of the game and recognizes its crucial turning points. And lastly, develops a thorough knowledge of all things baseball, the rules, the history of the game, and the facts and figures that come from extensive preparation on a daily basis. Thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, I saw Pat last weekend at Cubs convention, and I, I, I think Pat's going to be a Hall of Famer. I think he deserves the Ford Frick Award, and he's one of the he, – he makes it look so easy. Uh, he's just, like, just smooth, you know, and he, and he does all those things well. I love sending my tapes to Pat and, and hearing his perspective, and when you get a compliment from him, it, it means a lot because you know he's – you know, going to tell you the truth. He's a, a that straight to me, shooter. by the way, that's a testament uh, to skill. The easier a person makes something look, the better they are. It shouldn't look hard if you're good at your job. Yeah, no doubt. But I agree with all those things, um, and, and and I think that that would be a good thing to 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 you know make a copy of and send to the executives that I just talked about. When I hear a bad broadcaster, I I, I don't blame that guy. I blame the guy that hired that guy. Because if you're going to hire someone that's not good on the air, then it's it's your responsibility to make them better. And so I, I don't know. It's you know the funny thing is when you when you you meet p former players and they want to be broadcasters, right? And then and I think it goes one of two ways. There, there's the one way where they get on the air and they just think, hey, this just like I told you before, we're great, you know. And and you listen, and it's like, oh my gosh, I can't stand this. Or those guys that get there and they go, you know what, this is this is a job, and you you see them progressively get better, and they, and they realize, hey man, you know what, I'm gonna have to work on this just like I'm gonna have to like I had to work on you know hitting the curveball or staying off the slider away you know or throwing a strike in a certain spot. Um, it, it it really it's really tough to be good at it. I mean, it's easy to get on the air, um, but if you take those 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 principles there. I mean, that, they're really the bedrock of, of doing this job. You know, I really don't have anything to add, except I, I just feel like in our business, 
you know, I, I say this a lot, you know, so-and-so likes to taste himself, you know, he really likes just to, but likes himself <laughs> too much. Don't take yourself too seriously. Don't think you're that good. You know, yeah, don't pat yourself on the back, you know, work really hard to be the best you can be every day. And, um, you know, and, and, and be motivated by the things you don't do well. You try to improve the, you know, the areas of your broadcast that are, that are good, but really try to pay attention to the things that you're not doing well. And, uh, and, and don't be afraid to ask someone that will give you an honest opinion. I mean, if you send your tape out to, and, and, you know, and you don't get any like criticism back, then someone's not paying attention. I mean, you know, I, I sent a tape to Pat and the stuff that he finds, I think this is a great inning. <laughs> and it's like, hey, this was good, but you know, you said this, and you could have said this. And, and what it really, it, what it really makes you do is just keep focusing on being better every day, even if you're good enough. Even I'd say, even if you were in the major leagues, even if you were Pat Hughes or Marty Brenneman or you know the greats that are out there right now, John Miller, Ken Korak, you know, guys, I just I, I can't get enough of on the radio. I'm sure there's stuff that they're listening to, and they're going, you know what, I. I wish that I was a little bit better at, you know, at that. Um, and, and because they're professionals, you know, they're constantly looking at it and going, hey, we, we can do better. It's interesting to me. I'd compare it to a martial art in terms of every time that you think you, you've earned that next color belt and here you go, there's still another level to be achieved. Yeah, I mean, that's a good way of putting it up. I, I, I think it was Joe Davis that said one time, it's like a golf swing, you know, and it's like you get your golf swing down and then, you know, and then all of a sudden, you, for whatever reason, you, you, you were like under par Friday and then here's Sunday and you can't get the ball on the green, you know. You're constantly working on trying to improve and that pun swing. intended, different strokes work for different folks. If you are some way, if your voice is a certain way or the way that you talk, your syntax, whatever it might be, your mind works a certain way, you can't be listening to someone else and saying, boy, how can I be more like them? Because that takes you farther away from you. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. And the, the toughest part of this entire thing is trying to find your own identity because we all come into this business emulating someone else and then the other part of it too is that we're i think we're radio and tv are right now is that everyone sounds kind of the same you know and i think that's what the, the executives from the big you know the espns and the foxes and stuff they kind of have this mold that they're looking for and if you don't fit that mold the way they want it you know then you're not going to get an opportunity so you almost have to do that you know but to be really great you can't sound like someone and on that note so, you know, it's like they got to walk this line and then you got to figure out how, you know, when you're going to come off of it and how much you're going to come off of it and, and, when, and how much you're going to stay on. On that it. note, Marty Brenneman, this is his last season. Yeah. There's nobody who broadcasted a game like Marty Brenneman. Yeah, I mean, I got to be honest, too. I, I'm not surprised. Uh, he he kind of hinted about that to me and, and Len Casper a couple of spring trainings ago that, that this day was going to come sometime soon, you know. And I'm sad to see it happen. Uh, I remember as a kid, you know, before there was XM radio and tune in and you could hear the games uh, wherever you were, you know, I, I would get him and Jim Nuxall uh, on a certain night in Baltimore, you know, when the, when the clouds were just the right way. And, uh, and one of the best broadcast teams ever, you know, and Marty, he's, he's the straight shooter. He's going to, he's the every fan. You know, he's the guy, and I, and I really try to be this way, um, where you, you feel like him or Harry Carey or these guys where you're just sitting at a bar and you're watching the game with them, and they're just telling you what they think about the game, you know, and it's a conversation with their with their analyst, you know. And then Jim Nuxall, you know, maybe good cop, bad cop, it reminded me of my grandfather, you know. Like, like he just always seemed to have, like, the right spin on things, you know, and, and it's always seemed to have like that positive mentality. Uh, you know, it's, it's different now than it was back then. I mean, you know, it, it, it honestly, it is, even though I think they're really good, Marty and Tom, it's weird having a father son on the, on the same broadcast to me. Um, you know, that nothing against them personally. It's just like, you know, it's just, it's just kind of something that you maybe won't see a lot of, you know, and really haven't seen. Uh, I love Cowboy on there. It's going to be interesting, though, the, to, to watch, you know, the, the Jim Days and, and uh, my buddy Tommy Thrall, who 
are now after this year going to have to replace someone that you can't replace. You can't replace Marty. And I, I listen to him and I hear some of the stuff that he says and I know he's right. But I also know that if I said that, I wouldn't have a job <laughs> sometimes. <you know? laughs> so I'm like, you know, I kind of, you know, like I tip my cap to him. But but also he's earned that. You know, he's been there since the 70s. And he's been one of the best since the 70s. He's been a Hall of Famer since, what, like 2000. Uh, and and I'm sure there are some executives that that don't always appreciate his candor. But the fans do. And... The minute that he stops talking on the radio, and from what I read, it sounds like he's going to do a different deal than I mentioned Chuck Thompson retired, but you would see him. George Grand is a Reds guy. He's retired, but he pops back on every once in a while. It doesn't sound like Marty's going to do that. And it's a shame because I wish he would because it would be great to kind of, you know, have him around in some capacity. It sounds like when he's finished, that's it. Still a young guy, too. I mean, like, he, and I know maybe not. You know, he, he probably doesn't feel that way, but I look at him and you see him and he's in great shape and still, you know, he's still with it upstairs and he still brings it to the broadcast every day. But it sounds like at the end of the year, he's gone and, and, and that's, it, you know, we're not going to get another one like, and, and like I was getting to before, I'm sure some of the front office doesn't like all his honesty because, you know, when the team's not winning, you know, it, it, it makes it tough. But at the same time, you know, when the team's winning and the guy gives you a compliment, like with the Cubs, Cubs fans have always had this kind of, you know, Marty's said a lot of things Cubs fans don't like. They've had their say about him. But you know what? When the Cubs were turning the corner and, and became one of the best teams in the league, you know, when Wrigley Field had all the renovations and stuff, and he, he mentioned how good the team was or how the renovations were, a lot of those same people kind of got it then. You know what, man? We really appreciate this guy because him saying it, really means something. I have heard criticism of some modern broadcasters from fans, from their local people saying, this doesn't feel like my person. This doesn't feel like he's speaking from me. And I think at the very essence, a broadcaster has to connect to their listenership. If you're the voice of a team, your fan base should feel like you represent them. Whatever you see, whatever you feel, you need to connect to that, whether it's Marty, whether it's Harry Carey, and right onward. And that's where, going back to when you were talking about the decision makers and what they're looking for in broadcasters or what they're not looking for in broadcasters, a broadcaster has to connect to the fans because that relationship, that strengthens the fanship's loyalty to the team and their love of the team. It's tough to look at one area and say, ah, let's not prioritize the broadcaster. And then you understand how much Vin Scully has meant to Dodgers fans, how much Marty has meant to Reds fans and onward that's been the nucleus that they're holding on to. Well, yeah, and I, and I say this too. When you get into, I mean, just forget about who the broadcaster is. A at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is sell yes. a product, right? You've got to go out and sell, you know, let's just say Reds, just because we're talking about the Reds. So you're going to sell, there's going to be a certain amount of people that are going to listen to the game just because it's Reds baseball. They care about the Reds. I mean, there's, there's, there's a team or two, uh, that and Major League Baseball, that their broadcasts are just so awful that you could not listen to them. I mean, just to be honest, um, that you just couldn't listen to them. I mean, like, it, unless you really love that team, there's no way that if they were broadcasting the Tennessee Smokies or the, you know, the, the, the lug nuts, that you would turn that on and listen to it, which makes our job a lot tougher, to be honest with you, because people don't, they, they like the teams, but they don't know the players because they, they don't stick around that long. You know, you're, you're, you're trying to, <laughs> you're trying to keep people listening when it, it might not necessarily be too. What's the first that, question right? you get when you have a great um, player in there? How long is he going to last? When does he get promoted? Yeah. Right. So, so at the major league level, you know, like it's been proven. I mean, even if you, you know, you hire the, just the two worst, it, it's just terrible. Right. I mean, just if you're grading F, they still have the job for whatever reason. The owners like them. The you know the radio station likes. Them. Maybe they've just been there and they never take a day off. I, I don't know, but they're there. And as a fan of broadcasting, you listen, and it's like, oh, this is awful. I meet a ton of broadcasters, and we talk about listening to the San Francisco Giants broadcast because it's amazing. You know, John Miller and and Fleming, Kuip and Kuip. I mean, those guys 
it, it doesn't get any better than that. You talk about a four-man team, and, and it's like whether you're in San Francisco and you listen to the Giants because you just say you just like the Giants, right? They're a fan of the team. You're going to listen no matter if it's a bad team or not. But us, the casual listener, you know, how many people in San Francisco turn into Giants fans because they, the radio's on, and then they that's their broadcast, which is amazing, right? Uh, it, it's the best broadcast in baseball, and I, I feel like when you put on a great product like that, that it's got to be easier to sell. And I think that when you know you're just kind of throwing this together, some some of the executives forget about that part of it. You know, it's it, it's like it's okay that to to want to have someone that you can control in that spot. And I mean, I'm 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 thinking that that's where a lot of this game's going. I saw Pete Rose in, um, in, in Vegas for winter meetings, and we talked for a while. And Pete, and Pete was saying, you know what? That, you don't have a lot of big, like, uh, a big name managers anymore because he said the front office wants to send the lineup down and tell these guys what to do, right? And I don't disagree with that. I don't know if that's true or not. I've heard that. And if Pete says it, you know, I mean, I'll take his word for it. But I think it's the same thing with broadcasters. I, you know, let's, let's – if we can control this person, who cares what it sounds like? You know, we know that we're not going to have a controversy. And the other part of it, too, and, and to kind of take the side of the executive, is that the, life's a lot different now than it was when Marty started in 1977 or whatever. Because you got Twitter, you got Facebook, you got people that are constantly trolling for you to make a mistake, for him to make a mistake, for you to be misquoted, for you to offend someone. See, as a broadcaster, you know, you're kind of going on this, you know, you're on this, this path every day where you really hope that, you know, that you don't say anything that someone misconstrues. I'll, I'll tell you a story. I talk a lot about the Negro League because Satchel Paige is probably my favorite player. I never saw him play, but I didn't see Babe Ruth either. But I've read a lot of stories when I see Billy Williams. I love to ask him about Satchel. They grew up in the same town. He knew Satchel's, you know, family. I just, when, when you watch, like, or read anything about Satchel, he just seems like someone that not only would I like to watch play, but I would have just liked because he was funny and, you know, kind of like the organizer and a leader. And anyone that goes to Birmingham, you got to check out the uh, Southern League, uh, the, the Southern League Negro League Hall of Fame or museum or whatever, but they got this Satchel Page simulator where he's a hologram of him throws his pitches. You can actually stand behind it and, and push this. That's a side note, but anyway. And, and so going back to this, I'll, I'll talk about the players that were in the Negro League, and these guys didn't play in, in, in Major League Baseball. And someone heard the game, heard half of what I was saying, I guess, and was offended, and they called the, 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 the team and the station, and, you know, how could I talk about this? And I said, the and I said, well, look, I'll handle this the next day. And I said, the next day I go on air, I said, I'm going to keep talking about the, the Negro League and those players because we can't – I can't, as a storyteller, forget about all these great players that didn't have a chance. I mean, Satchel was like 50 pitching in the big leagues. Can you imagine how many wins he would have had if he would have – gotten the same opportunity as Greg Maddox, uh, who I think named one of his kids after Satchel, by the way, um, or, or all these other players that had the opportunity with the skill that he had that would have been in the big leagues at like, you know, 18, you know. Thrown. But anyway, at the end of the day, I don't want to offend anyone, you know, but I'm going to keep telling my story. And you know, here's a person that paid little attention to what the whole – point of the story was or what it was about and was just looking for something to get offended over. I think, I think right? the outreach is the easier. Day, the whole point was I think the outreach is easier. I think if you go back to a Red Barber time or Marty Brenneman or wherever it was, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, if fans were upset, what did they do? They had to call the team right. for them to send you a letter. <laughs> yeah. And now yeah, right. it is in our best interest and in the team's best interest for us to be on Twitter, social media, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it is, just right. basically saying, here's what's going on, letting you know more about the players, letting you know from the inside and interacting with folks. So it is to everyone's best interest that we make that charge down that avenue. And yet it is so much easier for folks to reach out to us if they're upset with whatever we might've said. Right. 
But I mean, for an executive, you know, they don't care. You know, the front office here, they were worried about it. And I'm like, listen, I, I'm going to handle that. And I'm sure whoever was complained probably realized, hey, we're, we're kind of on the same side here. And, and we just went on with life, you know, never heard another word about it. Um, you, the, 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 the bigger the venue, the more people that are listening, you know, the more ears that are on it, the more eyes that are watching, you're going to have to deal with that a, a lot more. And, um, and so I know that's a part of it that factors in as well. And, and I wonder, you know, if guys like Marty would be able to get a job in this market, you know, uh, it, and I know, I mean, I think he's one of the greatest ever, you know, or Vince Gully, you know, would they think he told too many stories now, you know, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, even the broadcast format's different. It's like, you know, you, you kind of have like, you, you know, Vince on there by himself or he was right. Well, now you got, you always have to have the color analyst, the former player, and and, and the play-by-play guy. You know, so it's 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 a different type of broadcast when you do. Let me give you the pro and anti for Marty getting a job in today's day and age. I think that the pro is <laughs> how many guys do we see out there right now who are hot take artists who, because of that, that's how they're getting their salary. And so if there's a play-by-play -play right. broadcaster who gets hired on the fact that he will rip guys who he thinks deserve getting ripped, I think a team or part of a fan base would love it but i also think that we understand the players the general manager the brass everybody now it's working much closer together and so a broadcaster will hear from the players will hear from the brass if when they step over the line I, my very first time in a major league clubhouse i saw a broadcaster player confrontation so i think that really? if you're a rookie broadcaster you don't have that cachet to stand on yeah, yeah. Jody Davis has told me one where Harry Carey got had one of those when he was a player, <laughs> and jo Jody, a good friend of mine, uh, and I have actually broadcasted games together in spring training. Now he's the AAA manager of the Louisville Bats, but I don't. I haven't had many of those, thank goodness. I, I, I'm pretty good at kind of knowing, <laughs> you know, how to how to be critical without you know, going over the line. Part of it is that I, I, and I faced 95 before and it's not easy to hit. <laughs> you can look really foolish when someone throws 95 at you and then comes back with a slider or a change up. So I, I think that experience helps me a lot too uh, when it comes to playing the game. And I can remember sitting on the bench as you kind of go up and my skill level fell off and, and watching players and wondering like, what makes that guy so good? And, and why, what makes me not so good, you know? And so I think when you're fair, I think that's part of it too. You know, you want to be fair. Len, Len Casper is the best I've ever seen uh, on kind of being able to once in a while say something, but not say it in a way where he's causing any controversy or offending anyone. Because some stuff you have as a broad, you know, at, in our job, you have to say it, but you don't have to say it in a way where you're in someone's face with it. You know, you can, you can, you know, you can say something without being, you know, starting a conflict. And, and, and I watch him do that and I try to be the same. It's about way. stating the facts. If you're simply stating what actually occurred, the, the best time that I had a player correct me was I said about this player who's playing second base, he never played second base. I'm looking over all the stats that I can find and he's only been a first baseman and third baseman. And after the game, he called me aside and he said, actually, I was a second baseman for all these years before I got switched. And then I learned something. But you work right. with the facts that you have if there's something that needs to be corrected. But if there's a, an opinion that gets stated, then you better have the information needed to back it up. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Well, I mean, and the other thing, too, you know, we deal with guys getting suspensions for steroids or off the field stuff now that wasn't part of the game, you know, back when, when let's say when Marty started in 77, I mean, you really just, it, it didn't happen. I mean, it happened, back we, just didn't, we didn't know about it. Right. Yeah. We didn't really know about it. I mean, this was really heinous. Uh, and, and you deal with that stuff and players are sensitive to, to anything that's going to hurt their brand. Uh, but, you know, when you point out the things that, guys do well I, I mean I, I can remember uh, Kyle Hendricks coming through and and I was just so sure he was going to be good 
And I knew that the radar gun didn't back me up and that the scouts, you know, they were kind of, uh, but I just could tell. I mean, I just knew. I, I, I tried to hit those kind of guys before who, are, who have that, you know, late movement on the cutter and can spot all their pitches. I, I saw him through a bullpen one time and he hit the, he hit a spot like every time, but one, like 25 throws, he missed one guy. Even the greats can't do that. So I, I had this feeling and I, you know, I kind of said it and said it and I was glad when it worked out, you know, <laughs> but, but I mean, like, I, I think for me personally, being in the batter's box against guys like that, playing the game has helped me. Uh, when I do basketball, you know, it's a different thing. I really need an analyst that played because I didn't play that. Way. You know, I, I play maybe outside a little bit, but I don't always know that, you know, I can't sit there and watch and understand why someone's better than someone else, you know, but in baseball, because you know, I played you know, so many games as a kid, you just know, you can just tell. Um, and then going back to the other thing, I, I just think you're right. I mean, you want to be fair and, 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 because here's the other part. If you're, if you cause too much trouble, guess what? You're, oh, yes. you're not employed. We have a number of comments sent in. Are you ready for some questions? All yeah, right. Let's go First, ahead. from Anthony Salazar, do you guys see future ballparks that will be constructed down the road relying more on public funds, or is there a shift to more privately financed stadiums? I don't feel like this is my bailiwick or, or uh, expertise. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's it just really depends on where you live. Uh, you know, I mean, like here in the South, you know, uh, the the uh, local governments are, the you know, they, I think that they're more willing to spend the money to build mm -hmm. a new ballpark. You know, and you look out in, in Oakland and stuff and the, the struggle that the A's have had, and I know the Giants have been part of that, but it's taken kind of a coalition and didn't the giants use a lot of like private money to build their stadium too and, and, and i mean like uh, it depends on how well financially your city's doing too you know it's hard to go build a brand new stadium when you know you're not doing too well and taxes are high and people are unhappy and stuff so uh you know, i i don't know i mean like i love the game and however they figure it out as long as there's you know, baseball, I'm happy. Thoughts on the fan experience at minor league baseball games as opposed to major league baseball games? Uh, for me, I think if you just came and, and you weren't really concerned about the quality of play, you're going to have a better experience in the minor leagues. I mean, you're going to be able to afford your food. You know, you're not going to get killed with, with all the high prices of parking and everything else that goes along with it. But you go to a major league game because the baseball is just way better. Um, I, I'll give you an, an example. Last year, Chris Bryant showed up at Smokey Stadium for a rehab. And uh, 7,000 people showed up on a Monday night. I mean, it went from probably being a, been a crowd of about 1,000 to 7,000. And we you know, maybe had two days to announce what was going on. And that's when I realized, okay, yeah, no wonder these guys make so much money, you know, because you, you show up to watch them play, right? You're not worried about, you know, tossing, you know, a fish into a net, you know, in between innings or, you know, we, we had a game last year here where we had, uh, and, and it was like a promotion that other teams had done, but it was free beer night. So uh, you got free beer as long as the other team didn't score, which the third, I think the second or third guy scored. So it, was <laughs> it didn't last long, but you wouldn't do that in a major league game because you would go to watch Chris Bryant and Javi Baez and, and how amazing they are at baseball. So I think the fan experience, if you're not concerned as much about what's happening on the field is better in the minor leagues. But, you know, for someone like me, I, I would take a major league game every time because I want to see the play. Push forward just a little bit. And that is this Chris Bryant will sell tickets. And then every time that he's at the plate, the crowd is riveted. There are so many moments that when you're inside a major league ballpark that you might not be riveted. And so the question is that fan experience, that's something that because the minor leagues, you can't depend on the players by and large. There are certain other things that you just can't depend on in the minor leagues. So what can you control? You can make sure that folks coming in have a really good time via this way or that way. I remember as a kid going to Memorial Stadium and what was the one thing that I looked <laughs> forward to? It was stupid, but 
during the in-between innings up there on the big video board, I would get to watch baseball bloopers. And that was my favorite thing in the world. I would go, okay, middle of the fifth blooper inning, let's watch it. And it would be a guy dropping a pop fly. And I loved it. So I think any little thing, you don't have to push it too far, but the little things that make a fan, a family, someone by themselves, people on a date, a group of buddies, whoever it is, just say, I enjoy this, whether it's the food, the drink, the entertainment, whatever it is, any little thing that can help them enjoy that experience just a little bit more on top of the baseball, not distracting from it. I'm anti-wave because my feeling is the wave distracts from the game. I can't pay attention to both. <laughs> but as long as it it adds to it, I'm all in favor. Hey, it's funny that we both went to Memorial Stadium as kids because I did too. And I, I remember going and you would walk up those big turnstiles you know, like coming in off of like 33rd and you'd go up and, and you'd have to walk forever to get up there. And But there was like that crack, you know, that you could look through. And, and I remember seeing Cal Ripken at shortstop and Eddie Murray over at first base, you know, during batting practice. And those guys are, you know, fielding the ball and then getting just chills because these are the guys I listened to on the radio and watched on television. Um, and so, you know, like that's that to me, a major league game. You can't beat that. Another thing is like, the fans themselves are great. I mean, you, you, you were, I was actually on that video board at Memorial Stadium as a kid. I painted my face up orange and white and black with my best friend. And um, Greg Olson came in. We were singing Wild Thing. Remember when yes. we were what a curveball. And then, uh, yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. And so, right. And so they, he was, like, warming up. And then every strikeout, the guy, camera guy was, like, right in front of us. And was, I still have a picture of it. Uh, so, so funny. I had a bird nose, the little bird noses. They saw. Like, do you remember wild Bill Hagee? You remember yes. wild Bill Hagee? He used to sit in like section 34, right? And, and it would just like, he'd be up there. Yeah. Like doing the, the, o, you know, the Oriole chants and stuff. And this guy, yeah, this guy, for those of you that, that have no idea what Jesse and I are talking about, we never went to games together as kids, by the way, but we were probably at some of the same games. Um, there was this cab driver in Baltimore. And this guy, I mean, like, he just would come to the games. He'd wear this big cowboy hat. He had all these Oriole pins on it. And, he, and he'd wear, like, an orange Orioles jersey. And he would lead, like, a section in the upper deck and cheers. And it became so popular that people would just go there to, like, just watch this guy do cheers in between pitches and stuff. And he was a cab driver. And the guy would, like, bring – you could bring your own beer in at the time. So, I mean, like, <laughs> he'd, he'd bring in his cooler – and I guess the cheers would get better as the night would go on and those, you know, those beers would disappear. So, you know, when they moved them to Camden Yards, I mean, that, that, all that stuff ended, you know, because you're, it, it's more of a moneymaker, you know. Like, we used to go to the games on Sunday for a dollar at Memorial Stadium. Uh, but, you know, going back to the, the, the fan experience, like, I used to sit in the bleachers because that's what we could afford. And my dad and I would be out there and it would be like grown-up language and, you know, and heckling and everything. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it, you know, and I don't know how it is at the minor league games. I think it's, they're more fan, you know, family friendly and, uh, in a way, you know, but I, I, I'd say this, if you love baseball, there's a reason to, to check out both minor I league and major. I think league. that maybe folks are just starting to learn, or maybe they're, they're about to learn how much more fun can be added to the major league with players weekend, what the players are enjoying doing and embracing. And what when we do something wild in the minor leagues, like for example, having players wear a Game of Thrones jersey, whatever it is, how much the players embrace it. Yeah. That there's so many folks who take the major league seriously because things should be taken seriously. The players and the fans, I think, would both embrace. You don't have to push it far, but there is some more fun to be had. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that it benefits Major League Baseball, like, to, to come off some of the old-time rules, you know. Like, Ben Zobrist last year wanted to wear his personalized cleats. Uh, you know, I get it. Look, we, we have these, you know, the, the, we want the uniform to look like the uniform. I, and I'm not saying I want it to be like winter ball in, you know, Puerto Rico or, or Mexico or wherever where they have, like, patches and, you know, advertisements on them. I don't ever want to see that, but – having someone put their personalized cleats on as long as they match the uniform doesn't really 
bother me at all. And I like when I see guys and they've got like that green tape on their bat. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that's where the NFL got themselves into trouble. You know, they wanted to try to put everyone in a box. You know, hey, this guy, we don't want this guy to celebrate. You know, people are different now. The game's different now. You know, I, I saw David Bodie hit the biggest home run that he'll ever hit in his career last year. He had, had a, a walk-off grand slam, Cubs down three with two outs and a 3-2 count in the ninth, right? Like a golden home run. And he, and he flipped the bat after the home run. And then I heard him on the radio later that week uh, on 670 to sh score in Chicago. And he was apologizing for the bat flip. I'm like, don't apologize for that. Like, if you're pitching and you give up that home run in that spot, you know that's not <laughs> showing you up. And the other part of it, too, is I started broadcasting, and there were a lot of, uh, of guys who played in the game, you know, way back in the day, right? Russ Nixon. I love Russ. Learned so much about baseball. Managed the Braves. Managed the Reds. He was a lifer. And Russ managed the Salem Avalanche when I was there. And I, I interviewed him every day. And he used to have me sitting in his office with his uh, Blanton sitting there behind me, which is very, very delicious bourbon from, from Kentucky. Russ was from Cincinnati, or as he would say, Cincinnati. And he, <laughs> once in a while, you know, that, that bourbon would find its way in a glass after a game in, in, in my hand. And he would just tell me stories, you know, hey, look, this is how we do it. This is how you play the game. You know, you don't run up the score. You don't take a base and all that. But it's different now. You know, they do take a base now. They're trying to score as many runs as they can. They don't turn the spigot off much uh, anymore, you know. If you're not holding a guy on, he's going to take second. If a guy flips the bat, it's not necessarily mean, you know, meaning that, that it's dis disrespect for you. And I think one of the reasons why – is that we have so many guys from the, the Caribbean, you know, from Latin America that, that bring what I think is a great flavor to the game of excitement and energy. I don't want to take that out of it, right? I, I want that to stay in there. So here's David Bodie flips his bat, and he's on apologizing. And I want to apologize. So, you know, I want to say, hey, look, and, and like he said, well, it was in the moment, you know, but he, and he's such a great kid, David Bodie. I mean, he's a – yeah, he deserved that moment because he worked hard for it. Um, and he's such a humble guy and he just doesn't want to show anyone up. But it's a shame that that's, that's one of those things that you have to do. You have to go out and apologize uh, because the NFL tried to take like the celebrating and all that stuff out of the game and fans didn't like it. Now they're kind of bringing it back again. The funny thing to me is I think that there's a bit of faulty memory at work. Big Detroit Tigers fan growing up somehow, some way with Trammell and Whitaker. I watched the 1984 World Series. I went back and I got for myself the full games just so I could enjoy it. Guys were hitting home runs, putting their arms into the air and running down to first base, celebrating the entire way in the middle innings because it's the joy. It's the whole jubilation of it all. Yeah. And this is not all that far back. You can find Mickey Mantle bat flipping videos. It's. <laughs> yeah. Or how about Babe Ruth oh. pointing for a home run? I, like, I, I don't know. I, I saw a video where Babe said that he kind of made me feel like it, he really wasn't pointing no. for a home run. That, I don't believe he did, <laughs> but, but he I do believe he was pointing at Charlie Root in the Cubs dugout. Did you, did you, yeah, did you hear, did you see the interview where he talks about no. it? You don't know what I'm talking about? No? Okay, yeah. He, he kind of implied that, it, you know, like, but he said, hey, whatever they say, I'll, I'll take it. Um, look, it's a game. And if we ever forget it, it, it's a game, then we're, we're kind of losing the point of why, why, why we enjoy it while we're playing. It. You know, I, I hope it never becomes like too much celebrating and, and all that. I mean, I, I, I had a Cam Newton in a, a fantasy league and, you know, he, he got a first down at the end of this per, of a half of a game. And then and, and there were like 20 seconds left and he was so busy celebrating that they they ran off like 15 remember. seconds and then they, they never got that second play you know like they never got that third that's play just game that. situational it's awareness like doing the thing the, yeah yeah right so I, I get it like there's a there's the time and the place for all that but if you hit a walk off home run down three three two two outs bottom of the ninth at wrigley a bat flip is no big deal you, you hit it you write out an apology note to the pitcher you have it delivered <laughs> okay. Um, 
<laughs> Next question. Who are some broadcasters you recommend, the best storytellers on the air, and what are some of your favorite books by or about baseball broadcasters? Um, your book, Jesse. You know, Charlie Walter. Yep, there it is right there. Charlie Walter, who is going to be part of the Reds TV show this year, was my assistant a couple of seasons ago here. And he's great. He's a great friend, and he's just a really fun guy to be around. I love Charlie. He shows up. I don't, I don't know him from Adam's House Cat, and he's got your book. And that was kind of where he started, you know, because he, he, he wanted to know the vocabulary and kind of have a game plan on, uh, you know, on how to, how to do his job better. And, and when I said I knew you, he was, you know, it was, I got some street cred with him right away. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I'd, say, I'd say your book's a great starting point. Uh, you know, the, the Broadcasters by Red Barber, I mentioned that. He's got a couple other books that are, that are pretty good. I like reading the biographies of broadcasters because sometimes they'll put in a chapter or two uh, about how to do the job. And then there's other things, you know, like, you know, there, if you if you have trouble with an accent, you know, there's there's books that can help you out with that. Uh, you know, how to how to use your voice better as a tool. I mean, there's so many different things in this career uh, that that you, that you have to do to, to 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 improve. But the best way to do it because it's not it's not like there's a lot of shows like this where people are talking about broadcasting. Uh, it go on there and grab a book and and, and read it. Uh, you, and then the other part was you asked me, like, who are my favorite broadcasters storytelling? John Miller is, I think he's the best uh, on radio. Uh, you, know, I, you know, Pat's a, a great listen to. He's so smooth. Uh, Ken Korak, hit the voice of California. Every time I hear Ken on that A's broadcast, I just want to, you know, I, I told him this. I, I, I feel like I need a rag top, maybe like a, an old, like, VW bus, put my surfboard on top. And I'm cruising down, what is it, like Highway 1 or whatever, you know, and, and uh, just have my heading to the beach. I'm going to put the A's game on, and, uh, and I'm going to enjoy, you know, the, the sounds of California. I mean, he, he's so easy to listen to, and he's got some great stories uh, and kind of that California vibe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the Rangers have a really good broadcast. And, um, Eric Nadell and Matt I, you know, But there's – well, yeah, and, and I was going to say about Eric, Eric Nadell, he's a Hall of Famer. He's one of the best out there. And just going back to a point that we made earlier, and, and I remember him telling me, not only does he go back and listen to, like, vintage radio broadcasts, he tries to add new vocabulary to his broadcast every single season. Like, he just, like here's a guy who's the, one of the best in the business, and, and he's still pushing – to, uh, you know, to tr try to find that, you know, that thing that's going to make him a little bit better. And I, I, I think he's one of the, the best that's out there, uh, you know, because of that. You know, I, I listened to the Orioles broadcast, Joe Angel. He was kind of the guy that was – he was uh, John Miller's sidekick when I was a kid. And then now it's his broadcast, and, and he's excellent. Um, and, and now this is the funny thing. is like now we've, we've become friends with some guys – because we've worked with them in the minor leagues that are good. Uh, I think if, if you're listening to a young guy, Wayne Randazzo does a great job with the Mets. And he, you're going to get a lot more of Wayne this year than you got in years past. He would just kind of jump in. If you ever get a chance to listen to Ben Ingram with the Braves, uh, he'll be on a little bit more this year doing play-by-play. -play. He's been the pre- and post-game host. He's, he's good. He's got some great stories. I, I listened to a game that the, the – the, uh, Braves were playing the Red Sox. He was doing the game, and he was talking about somehow, uh, you know, Ichiro's swing and how it's like a pendulum and all this. That was like, wow, you know, I couldn't turn the radio off. So there's – John Miller, I think, to me, bar none, the best. And then I think there's, a you know, a lot of other guys that if, if you catch them on a game. Another guy, Terry Smith with the Angels. I like him a lot, too. You know, he was in the Southern League. So, you know, way, way back in the day, him and um, – and, and uh, uh, Rick, Rick Rizzo, uh, you know, like those guys, it's like uh, Riz is with um, the, the uh, Seattle Mariners and then, and then Terry. And I, I, I catch them off the air and I'm like, hey, you know, tell me about the old Southern League, you know, and then they get on and do their thing. And um, they're, they're good too. So, but, I, you know, if, if it's not your team and you're just listening for the broadcaster, 
that's why you really need the MLB at bat. I feel the same as you. I feel like we could list a lot of guys. I'm going to go back. Ernie Harwell, the late Ernie Harwell. Nobody in my mind told stories like him because he would hide stories inside of stories. He once told me, my first oh, yeah. game, calling it in the major leagues. Now, the pitcher would later have his nose bitten off in a brawl. So the pitcher's out there. And I, I wanted to stop him, call time out right there and say, no, that story. I'd like to hear the story about the brawl with the nose. Those little stories tucked inside of stories, I think, are wonderful. You don't, one little sentence, one little note, and it tantalizes what's going on. And then we've moved on and it's something else. And I love that Vin Scully could start up a half inning and say, in this seventh inning, we're going to hear all about how Tommy Lasorda missed the bus and had to walk back home. Let's start up the seven. Right. Well, you, and now you're going back to what made what makes radio great. Uh, I, John Miller can do this. I try to do this on the air, and that's keep the game in perspective, right? Because the game's always got to be that's... the most important thing. That's why people are listening. And then tell a story about a guy with his nose getting bitten off, and then have your person, the person you're working with, be involved, right? And then maybe you're talking about something totally different, like the fan that dropped a foul ball, and then weave that all in in three outs, <laughs> you know, get all the things that you need to get in. Yes. And, right? Ernie was great at it. Um, it, it. Just take radio in general, right? I think the, the, the greatest radio people I listen to, uh, baseball or not baseball, right? Vin, Vince Gully. Um, Casey Kasem, Howard Stern, and Rush Limbaugh. I think those are the four, like, if you put a Mount Rushmore for me, and they're so different. I mean, like, you could sit here and say, well, I, 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 you know, like, you may not like Howard Stern. You may not like Rush Limbaugh. You may not be a Dodgers fan. But forget about, uh, you know, or and Paul Harvey. Let me throw Paul Harvey in there, too. You know, do you know who all these people are? I'm sure you do, right? So – but what, what made, they all had the same things in um, common. They were entertaining. They were educated. They, they, you know, they, they were quick. You know, they got to where they're getting to. Um, Howard Stern and, 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 uh, and Vin could have you watching the game or listening to the show and be doing five things at once, like you said. You, you want to know about the story about the guy with his nose getting bit off, but you also want to know about, you know, the runner at third and the manager in the dugout and the guy in the stands. And, you know, it, and, and for Howard Stern, I mean, he's got like, he's being funny. He's got the people on the show. He's got, you know, this crazy thing going on here and this comic over here and he's got the news over here. And it's like, it just, the, the meshing of the, the, the product, uh, the entertain, the entertainment value. I mean, listen to Casey Kasem. It's like, you know, here comes a Duran Duran song, and then he's got, you know, some long-distance dedication, and then he's talking about the time that Duran Duran got started, and there was a guy on the in the band that didn't make the, the cut, and now that guy's like, you know, that guy works at, you know, at Subway, and the rest of the band is, like, famous. You know what I'm saying? Like, and you hear these stories, and, and you can't turn it's, it off. It's the mastery of the time frame. There's no rush. They're going to get to the point of it. They're going to get to the whole meat and potatoes. And when they do, it's going to hit perfectly because the timing is so beautiful. Do you know the Vin Scully, Reggie Jackson right. story? Reggie no. tells Vin a story during BP. Vin says, Reggie, this story is too long to tell during your at bat. Reggie says, no, it'll be okay. Here's what we'll do. When I step in, you stand up. And when you're finished telling the story, sit down and then I'll finish the at bat. And so <laughs> and he steps in and he's stepping out of the box. He takes pitches. He's fouling off pitches. Vin sits down and then Reggie can swing away. Oh, man, I love Reggie. I wanted to be Reggie in the backyard as a kid. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me uh, about, about Mr. October. And, you know, Re Reggie, Reggie's dad was, uh, when you talk about the Negro League, played in the Negro League and um, – and and what uh, New Jersey and uh, you know Reggie came in and like he was just such a great player, but he also got like the historical perspective of it. You know, like he appreciated like the 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 Bob Shepard, the voice of the Yankees. You know, like 
then he the guy that nicknamed him the voice of God, you know, I mean, it's like that story about Reggie. I love that because I just think he's what baseball is all about right so there. This is what we're going to do. Myself, Mick, we'll get together on a weekly basis, ideally. And we'll talk about talking about baseball. Mick, how's that sound? That sounds good to me. Let's do it. He's Mick Gillespie. I'm Jesse Goldberg Strassler. Ballparkdigest.com. Big thanks to Kevin Reichardt and Ballpark Digest. Check in, subscribe to the newsletter, and we'll be right here, Facebook Live chatting on their Facebook page and see how things go from there. Thank you, Mick. Awesome. See you next next week. week.